I'm Bethany. And I'm Cassie. Today we're telling a story of siblings born and bred to run the world. They were the most infamous family of the 20th century. Their story drips with conspiracy. Their names whispered through the decades since they left their voices echoing in time and space. Their hands helped mold the America we know, sharing with their country dreams of landing on the moon, freedom for every man. And by example, they inspired generations to reach the highest heights. They played with fire, and only a few survived. Their words ring through our history books, their pretty faces on our television screens, and their signature will forever be stamped on our national identity. They stood in the trenches. We stood beside them. They flashed their diamonds. We flashed our cameras. They had their fun, and we saluted them. They were good. They were evil. They were human. They are the Kennedy siblings. We cannot talk about the Kennedys without talking bloodlines, pedigrees, and how the heck they became what they became. To start, we need to take a trip to yesteryear. Let's go back two generations to the Kennedy siblings' great-grandparents. So JFK, Bobby, Rosemary, their great-grandparents. On their paternal side, their great-grandfather, Patrick Kennedy, came to Boston from Ireland when fleeing the potato famines of the late 1840s. He made wagons and whiskey barrels for a living, and after marrying Bridget Murphy, fathered three daughters and a son before dying of cholera in 1858 at the young age of 35. On their maternal side, their great-grandfather Thomas Fitzgerald was also Irish, He stayed in Ireland for a little while longer, trying to hold on to his farm for as long as possible. But eventually, in 1854, the famine drove him to America as well. He initially settled in a farm town 25 miles outside of Boston, but times were rough and he eventually had to relocate to Boston's North End Irish ghetto. If you aren't a history nerd like we are, American immigrants used to congregate together in neighborhoods with all of the other people from where they were from. The Irish ghetto was a crowded slum of wooden tenements, kind of like apartments, but bare bones and not at all like apartments. Imagine wood floors, maybe some running water, but that's pretty much it. If you want to see what Cassie's talking about, you can either Google it or we also have interactive videos that have photos pop up as we talk about each scene and that's available on Patreon. So people new to America would bring their most prized possessions from their old world, just one suitcase or maybe two, and try to start over in a new place. But that was hard. Everything is different and new and strange, and so just to find a little bit of comfort and familiarity, you kind of flock to the other people who are also from your home. Someone who lived in the Irish ghetto at the same time as their great-grandfather said this, It was a dreary, dismal, desolate world in which all was mean, nasty, inefficient, and forbidding, except for the Catholic Church, which provided spiritual comfort and physical beauty. And that's another thing about the Kennedys. If you know anything at all about the Kennedys, you probably know that they were Catholic. Our first Catholic president, by the way, was JFK. The Kennedys were Catholic as you could be, in a new world full of Protestants. So that's another reason that people would cluster together similar faith and belief systems, but it was something of a scarlet letter to be Irish back then. A lot of people had fled the potato famines. This was all that JFK and his siblings knew about their ancestors, just that they had fled the famines and lived in Boston in the Irish ghetto. That was it. Their parents, Joseph Patrick Kennedy and Rose Fitzgerald Kennedy, told them very little about where they came from because they wanted to shed their Irish identity and become simply American. 
So Rose, the Kennedy's mom, put a lot of effort into ignoring their Irish heritage and made sure to take them to all of the historic revolutionary landmarks around Boston and New England. And Janet Bouvier was the same way, remember? Jackie and Lee's mom, if you've listened to the Bouvier episodes. Her maiden name was Janet Lee, and her family had escaped the Irish potato famine too, but she didn't want to be known as Irish, so she went around telling everyone that she was related to Robert E. Lee, the Confederate general. By the way, if you have not listened to the Bouvier sisters' episodes, go listen to those. Their story intertwines endlessly with the Kennedys. So it wasn't all from bad taste, though. Boston was notorious for Protestant American families that had been there since the Revolutionary War, treating Irish Catholics as less than. And a lot of that still lingers to this day. The Kennedy parents were privileged, but they still felt like outsiders, and they had the mentality that they needed to prove themselves. I've never been to Boston, so I don't know how it is now, but apparently pretentious attitudes were a dime a dozen, especially back in this time. There were harsh lines between classes, and coming from the quote-unquote wrong side of the tracks in Boston, just go look up the saying, where the Lowells speak only to the Cabots, and the Cabots speak only to God. You did not get to jump casts. A lot of it stemmed from how much history happened in Boston and how so many of the country's leaders were educated at Harvard. There was a chip on the shoulder of Boston's elite. Okay, so now let's talk about their children, the people who came to America fleeing the famines, children, the Kennedys' siblings' grandparents. These are people that the Kennedy siblings actually knew and hung around a lot. Both sets of grandparents were really big family people, and they were also huge public figures in Boston. They turned the family story from poverty to comfort and opened the door for Joe and Rose Kennedy, JFK's parents, to build the ridiculous wealth that they amassed. Patrick Joseph Kennedy, Joe Kennedy's father and JFK's grandfather, was born in 1858, the same year that his dad died. His mother, Bridget Murphy Kennedy, supported him and his sisters by herself as a saleswoman. When Patrick turned 14, he left school and went to work at the Boston docks to help support his mother and his three older sisters. He saved up all of his pennies and in his late 20s was able to start his career as an entrepreneur by purchasing a saloon and then a few more locations before starting his own company and becoming a leader in Boston's liquor trade. Wait, you said at 14? At 14, he left school and then his like entrepreneur journey started when he was an adult, when he was an adult. So he went to the Boston docks to work as a child, skipped high school. And then from there, he like saved up all his money from working at the Boston docks to start buying saloons. And then he ended up getting into the liquor business and making a lot of money. He became really popular among the locals and he was said to be super likable. He was always eager to help those in need with a little cash and some sensible advice, skills he had crafted during his time as a bartender in his saloons that he bought, and his reputation afforded him five consecutive terms in the Massachusetts lower house, establishing him as one of Boston's main Democratic leaders. He was even invited to give a speech at one of Grover Cleveland's parties. He was the president, by the way, if you need a little history refresh. Grover Cleveland, one of our presidents. So the Kennedys were already well on their way to becoming a prominent name even before the 20th century. Patrick married a girl from an affluent, quote-unquote, lace curtain Irish family. Her name was Mary Hickey, and this partnership solidified his move into Boston's middle class. They had two daughters and one son, Joe Kennedy, before Patrick's death in 1929. And then on the Kennedy siblings' maternal side, Rose Kennedy, their mom, was a Fitzgerald before marrying Joe. Now, this is where you really need to pay attention. This is where it all comes together. Her father, JFK's other grandpa, was even more well-known in Boston, and he also had a greater influence on his grandkids. Born in 1863, John Fitzgerald was the fourth of 12 children, His father, Thomas Fitzgerald, who was the farmer that eventually ended up leaving the outskirts of Boston and having to move to the Irish ghetto, Mm -hmm. had been able to find success as a street peddler 
and then later became a grocer. And then he ended up buying and renting tenements to Irish laborers. And he was able to open the door for further success for his kids. Because of this victory, his son and JFK's grandfather, John Fitzgerald, was able to attend Boston's famous Latin school, the same school that John Adams and his sons attended. More presidents, by the way. John Adams and John Quincy Adams, his son, were both presidents. John Fitzgerald graduated with academic honors and was also an excellent athlete. He went on to attend Harvard Medical School in 1884, but when his father passed in 1885, he dropped out. Medical school had been more of his dad's idea than his, and now he had six younger brothers to care for. So he went to work at the city's customs house and ended up as a secretary to one of Boston's politicians. In 1891, he used his love of people and politics to land him a seat on Boston's Common Council, and he lobbied to spend $350,000 in the early 1900s on a public park for the Irish ghetto in Boston's North End, the one that his family was from. He won this proposal over a bunch of representatives from wealthier areas, which was really impressive. He was a natural politician. He was known to have perfected the quote-unquote Irish switch. What is an Irish switch? So you chat with one person while shaking another person's hand, and at the same time, you're also smiling and throwing a wink at a third person across the room. So like multitasking schmoozing. Yes, that is the art of being a diplomat. (laughs) He was so warm and charming that people just started calling him Honey Fitz. He even had a poem written about him. Honey Fitz can talk you blind on any subject you can find. Fish and fishing, motorboats, railroads, streetcars, getting votes. His gift of being able to just chat endlessly became known as Fitz Blarney. Oh my God. He served three terms in Congress and consistently voted for local and statewide needs and for the continuation of unrestricted immigration. Once, when another congressman was lecturing him on the virtues of protecting this country from inferior aliens corrupting it, he asked Fitz, Do you think the Jews or the Italians have any right to this country? He replied, As much right as your father or mine. It was only a difference of a few ships. Mm, Snaps. Honey Fitz eventually became the mayor of Boston and married his second cousin, Mary Josephine Hannon, after waiting 11 years for her family to allow their union because he was her second cousin. Oh my gosh. (laughs) They met at 13 and 15 and fell in love. They ended up being married for 62 years and had six children, the oldest being Rose Elizabeth, JFK's mother. Little Rose was the favorite. Her dad, Honey Fitz, prayed for a daughter who would win him acceptance into high society. He dreamt of her upbringing even before she existed and wanted it to be like a fairy tale. He succeeded. Here's a quote from Rose. There have been times when I felt I was one of the more fortunate people in the world, almost as if providence or fate or destiny, as you like, had chosen me for special favors. So she was privileged and she freaking knew it. Mm -hmm. From her birth in the summer of 1890, Rose had it good. She remembered, quote, A big, old, rambling, wonderfully comfortable house. Serenity, order, family affection, horse and buggy rides to my grandparents' nearby home, climbing apple trees, picking wildflowers. Her father came home on weekends from Washington while serving as a congressman, and she recalled the thrill of meeting him at the train station where he would be so happy to see her and would always have a present for her in his suitcase. Quote, There was no one in the world like my father, she said. Wherever he was, there was magic in the air. And this sounds a heck of a lot like when people talk about JFK. This charisma and enchantment apparently was his family inheritance. In the summers, Rose's family would escape the heat on the coast of Maine, where a lot of the other prominent Boston families would also gather, and they would all hang out, 
fish, play cards, swim, and shop all along the beachfront. She remembered the joy of being surrounded by family and friends who, quote, visited back and forth constantly. She was sheltered even into her 20s. She had become a Boston celebrity as the mayor's intelligent and beautiful daughter and attended the elite Catholic school, Boston's Convent of the Sacred Heart, where she learned how to be a good mother and a good wife. Upon graduating, her parents took the two oldest Fitzgerald girls on a grand European tour to, quote-unquote, further their education. Except this trip was also motivated by Honey Fitz trying to prevent his family from finding out his guilt. He had just lost the election for another term as mayor and was under investigation for lining his pockets during his previous two-year term. Yikes. Of course, this was all over the media and everyone was gossiping. And so he came up with this brilliant idea to educate the girls in Europe. It was going around in the media as in newspapers. Yep. <laughs> Local newspapers that you can Probably escape. not going to work post-internet. Also, 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 this trip was to pull Rose away from a budding romance with Joseph Kennedy the son of a family with much less social standing. So Honey Fitz enrolled her in Holland's Convent of the Sacred Heart. That is shocking to me that the Kennedys had less. Much less social standing. Wow. After arriving back home, Rose played a large role in her father's second term as Boston's mayor from 1910 to 1912. So legit, he runs away to Europe, escapes all the heat, his family's none the wiser. He comes back, he runs again, wins, and he's back. <laughs> wow. So maybe like it wasn't that bad then if everyone voted for him again. I guess. I don't know. So Rose Kennedy, we're talking about JFK's mom. Right. And JFK's, like the Kennedy name yes. was not that great. Isn't that crazy? The, yeah, the generation above JFK. That's like the so Kennedys weird. hijacked the Fitzgerald's re- Social reputation. Social status, yeah. Quote. Fitzgerald delighted in the good looks of his daughter, in her intelligence, her presence of mind, and superb social skills. She proved to be her father's equal in conversation, curiosity, dancing, athletic ability, and powers of endurance, and even in the capability of fascinating reporters. So even JFK's mom was a smooth-talking politician. This stuff does not happen overnight. It happens over generations. Mm -hmm. Joe Kennedy had absolutely no doubt that he could reach the highest economic level. So this is JFK's dad, Joe Kennedy, that Rose is in love with. His father's success landed their family in the middle class, and if starting in the middle class didn't stop Rockefeller, Carnegie, or J.P. Morgan, it wouldn't stop Joe Kennedy either. So Joe Kennedy's dad is the one who left at 14, was raised by a single mom, went to the docks, started buying saloons, and then got into the alcohol business or the liquor business. In his lifetime, he went from poverty to middle class? Yep. Okay. And Joe Kennedy has his sights set on the highest highest of the portion of the upper class, aka president. Absolutely. (laughs) His son is president. It's crazy how quickly their family went from impoverished to comfortable to just absolute wealth. Being born in 1888, Joe grew up in an America that celebrated the entrepreneur, who not only elevated their own lives, but also expanded the resources available to others. Cheaper energy, railroads that opened up travel, banks that grew the economy. Joe went by the Darwinian rules to life. The strongest survive and the weak die off. It was the natural order. So there was really not a whole lot to say about the gap between the rich and the poor. However, there was also nothing wrong with the fortunate sharing their resources with the needy. And in fact, the innately talented and successful had a responsibility to help them. Joe was an avid reader as a kid, and he thrived off of these rags to riches stories of pre-Civil War America. There was a trend going around at the time of mind power and success through positive thinking, Joel Osteen type of stuff. (laughs) And it fascinated Joe. Anyone with God-given talent and abilities could succeed. It was just a matter of willpower. 
As a teenager, most of his friends were making extra money by throwing newspapers, selling candy to tourists, all the things that young Walt Disney also did to make money in Missouri right around the same time. If you haven't listened to the Disney Brother episode, just go listen, okay? You will be crying by the end of episode three. Okay, so back to good old Joe Kennedy. He needed to be different, special, more inventive and entrepreneurial. So instead of selling candy and apples, he came up with the idea to organize a neighborhood baseball team and become the general manager. He was also the coach and the first baseman. (laughs) He bought the uniforms, rented the ball field, scheduled the games and sold enough tickets to turn a profit. His teammates complained that he was too domineering and that none of them had any say in anything, but Joe made it clear that he did not really care. There could only be one boss, and he was not about to give up that title to anyone else. He told his sister at the time that his personal philosophy was, quote, If you can't be captain, don't play. And remember, this is JFK's father. That was Joe Kennedy. His mother thought he was special, too, so she enrolled him in Boston Latin, the school that his father-in-law, Honey Fitz, and John Adams attended. He didn't quite fit in there, though, so instead he put his head down and he committed to his achievements. He became a colonel on the drill team that won a citywide competition. He was the captain of the baseball team, and in his senior year, he was the player with the city's highest high school batting average, for which he won the Mayor's Cup. Afterwards, he went on to attend Harvard, where he still never fit in. Harvard was full of golden boys from millionaire families who came to college with servants and lived in luxurious residence halls with central heating, swimming pools, and private bathrooms in the early 1900s. Joe lived in the poorly heated dorms with primitive plumbing. Again, though, he did not allow it to stop him from taking everything that Harvard had to offer. He did not feel inferior. Instead, he built a social network of friendships with former classmates and athletes. And in his sophomore year, he and his closest friends became class leaders serving on the student council. After graduating in 1912, Joe started his career in banking. Not because he was talented in that field, he actually had to drop his finance class because he was failing but because he had heard of the astounding power and influence that bankers had over the national economy. So he was like, I don't care if I'm quote unquote well-adjusted to this. If that's the best that this country has to offer, I'm freaking going for it and I'm going to have a seat at the table. In the summer of 1906, when Joe was 18 and Rose was 16, they fell in love. Again, the Fitzgeralds saw the Kennedys as a step down the opposite direction that they wanted to be moving, and therefore were not excited about the pair. Honey Fitz did all that he could to discourage Rose from dating him. He forbid her from going to Harvard prom with Joe, and remember he also sent her off to that school in Holland. Wait, is Honey Fitz the one who fell in love with his cousin? Yeah, yes, and I think. Wait, had to wait on. like 11 years to Yes, it her? is, yes. Okay, they should be more understanding of love. Well... They weren't. <laughs> they weren't. Isn't that classic, though? Janet Auchincloss judging Jackie for marrying for money when that's yeah. literally what she me? did. Mm-hmm. Like twice. <laughs> Joe and Rose did not give up on their love. Here's Joe. Quote. I was never really interested in anyone else. After a four-month engagement at 26 and 24, Joseph Patrick Kennedy and Rose Elizabeth Fitzgerald were married in October of 1914. A month later, they bought a seven-room, two-and-a-half-story home on a quiet, tree-lined street in Boston. They couldn't really afford it. The house put Joe in $6,500 of debt back in the day, which was a stretch for him. But Joe could not imagine a bank president living in a rented apartment, and he had every confidence that they were on their way up. And so that's also why he hired a maid and bought a brand-new Model T Ford on credit as well. The following summer, Joseph Patrick Kennedy Jr. was born at Nantasket Beach in Massachusetts. Joe rented a house next door to his in-laws and hired two doctors, a nurse, and a housemaid to help care for Rose and the baby. In one baby. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, (laughs) all hands inside the vehicle at this time. This part 
is freaking creepy and insane. Before their first baby was born, speculation was that he would be named after his maternal grandfather, John Fitzgerald. But Joe Kennedy insisted that he be named Joseph Patrick Jr. after him. So even though Honey Fitz finds out that they're not naming his first grandson after him, he still predicted that the baby boy would have an incredible life. Here's a quote from Grandpa Fitz talking to a reporter. Quote, He is going to be the president of the United States. His mother and father have already decided that he is going to Harvard where he will play on the football and baseball teams and incidentally take all of the scholastic honors. Then he's going to be a captain of industry until it's time for him to be president for two or three terms. Further than that has not been decided. (laughs) Further than that? (laughs) Wow, thank you for leaving so much freedom for this child. He may act as mayor of Boston and governor of Massachusetts for a while on his way to the presidential chair. Oh, may he. Less than two years later, on May 29th, 1917, baby Joseph Patrick Jr. gets a little brother. And this is where it gets insane. There's not as much fanfare and drama around this birth. Honey Fitz didn't go off to the reporters being like, listen, here ye. But he was a healthy baby. He was a boy. They did name him after Grandpa Honey Fitz. His name was John Fitzgerald Kennedy. John Fitzgerald Kennedy was born in an upstairs bedroom in his family's Boston home with the same doctors and helpers as his big brother. Jack was first mentioned in the press by his proud grandpa Fitz, just like his big brother Joe, but no predictions attached. So it's weird because it's like he didn't make any predictions because he had been manifesting that whoever was named after him would be president. And then when Joe, the firstborn, wasn't named after him, JFK, or Jack, took all of the manifestation, and then he grew up to be the freaking president because he was named after Honey Fitz. He was named John Fitzgerald. I don't believe in any of this, but it, no, is, but it is weird. really crazy. <laughs> okay, so let's also address this name, Jack. People have been coming for me on TikTok because we've been like teasing that. And, well, and also with the Jackie stories. We've been posting on TikTok and I've been calling him Jack Kennedy and people have been coming for me. His name was not Jack Cassie. Yeah. I think you mean JFK. <laughs> I think you I mean think she John. Means John. I think she messed up. <laughs> but no, guys, I have actually done research and I actually know these stories. I promise you I'm not just getting up here and spouting nonsense. OK, so yes, his name was John. But he was also Jack. And everyone called him Jack. Yes. I don't know why. It's apparently like a commonly used nickname for John back in the day. It's the same amount of syllables. John, Jack. But it was like, I guess, more casual. And I guess a nickname doesn't have to be shorter. It's an endearing term. All of everyone in JFK's intimate life, friends and family, always called him Jack. Jack Kennedy. If you listen to the Bouvier episodes, you already know this. It was so confusing in that story with all of the Jacks. Jackie, her father, Black Jack, Jack Kennedy, there were more Jacks. But yes, Jack Kennedy. Also known as JFK. The same day that Jack was born, his father, Joe, was elected to the board of Massachusetts Electric Company, making him one of the youngest trustees of a major corporation in America at just 28 years old. Here's a quote from Robert Dalek's book, An Unfinished Life. It was the start of Joe's meteoric climb in the business world, which, paradoxically, the war would serve. Joe Kennedy did not believe in war. A lot of Americans viewed World War I as this romanticized, idealistic mission to end conflict and protect democracy, but Joe thought that sacrificing his life or anyone else's was ridiculous and futile. He was too cynical about human nature to believe that anything good could be accomplished by fighting. And this was actually a very unique perspective in his circle of colleagues. Also something unique to Joe's perspective was that he did not process or judge world problems on the morality or political ramifications, but instead on how he thought they might affect his life and his business ventures or those of his sons. Honorable. (laughs) 
At this point, Joe left the banking world and he got a job as the assistant general manager of Bethlehem's steel shipbuilding plant in Massachusetts. He only made a salary of $15,000 a year, but that is not what was so important about this job. The experience, business contacts, and most of all, the chance to show his skills in managing a multi-million dollar enterprise was invaluable and opened the door to bigger opportunities down the road. He was at this job for only 18 months. Joe worked around the clock, sometimes sleeping in his office for only an hour or two a night. He was also incredibly inventive, focusing especially on efficiency and effectiveness. They even gave him a bonus check when he left in the summer of 1919, stating, quote, For services rendered at a time when no one else could have done what you did. This is during World War I. Joe had made a promise to himself to make his first million before he turned 35. So he came up with a plan. He got a $10,000 job, which was a step down for him, to gain insider information, and he used the stock market to make investments that netted him nearly $2 million over the next six years. All of this money afforded Joe and Rose several more children. Remember, they are Catholic. In 1918, Rosemary was the first of four daughters right in a row. Kathleen was born in 1920, Eunice in 1921, Patricia in 1924. Robert Francis was born in 1925. That is the Bobby Kennedy. And then Jean Anne in 1928 and Edward Moore in 1932. And that's Ted Kennedy, by the way. Nine children in 17 years. Joe loved the attention that his big family brought him, and he also loved the image that it portrayed. The fact that he could provide a lavish life for so many people. In 1921, they moved to a 12-room house with a long enclosed porch that the kids could play on, and they got a live-in nanny. But like we've talked about in all of our wealthy sibling stories that we've covered, Resources do not eliminate troubles, and for all of the status, image, and privilege that the Kennedys had, they had more problems. Joe and Rose kind of barely got along, and the kids knew it. It was a heavy burden. Rose's staunch religious views and the intense requirements that she learned from the schools that she had been to didn't allow much fun or joy in everyday life. She meticulously followed rules and expectations set by the culture that she grew up in without much question. So we know that Joe was always thinking outside the box and prided himself on being an independent thinker. He still mostly played by the rules of society, but he was just a bit different and willing to be a bit different. And he was proud of that. The thinking outside the box mentality did not stay confined to business for Joe. His willingness to defy accepted standards came out the strongest in his habitual love affairs. So I'm going to go into Joe's relations and endless affairs because it sets up the context that the Kennedy kids grew up in. And you'll see later, the Kennedy way of thinking was just completely jacked up and not normal and highly influenced by their father, Joe Kennedy. Most people speculate that it started because Rose would rarely have relations with him because she was so strictly Catholic, but do I care? Absolutely not. Joe was a scumbag when it came to his marriage. He had endless casual lovers. A famous story about the Kennedys is that at a dinner party or some like gathering with friends, Joe was teasing Rose in front of a group of friends and he said something like, Now listen, Rosie. This idea of yours that there's no romance outside of procreation is simply wrong. It was not part of our contract at the altar. The priest never said that, and the books don't argue that. And if you don't open your mind to this, I'm going to tell the priest on you. In front of people, I would have died. But Rose apparently did not change her mind because after her last child was born in 1932, one of her friends reported that she declared, quote, No more sex. And moved herself into a separate bedroom. Regardless of Rose's choices, though, Joe would have still been exactly who he was. 
He had to win everything all the time and was never content. He made everything into a competition and he was always looking for new challenges in business, politics, banking. So it's hard to believe that he would have ever been content with one woman. Maybe Rose knew that and she was like, (laughs) screw you. Joe also put forth very little effort to hide his unfaithfulness. Joe wrote to a theater manager in New York once. I hope you will have all the good-looking girls in your company looking forward with anticipation to meeting the High Irish of Boston because I have a gang around me that must be fed on wild meat. Who talks like that? Pigs. A political reporter who knew Joe said, quote, For him, women were another thing that a rich man had, like caviar. It wasn't sex. It was part of the image. His idea of manliness. And what year is this? I have to ask that in every episode. (laughs) (laughs) At least once. This is in like the mid-20s. When you just said that, it made me think like, not just Great Gatsby, but the whole like party flapper girl. Carnivorous. Yeah. Animal-like behavior because everyone was swimming in like the best time of their life. Therefore, everyone was like drinking and doing drugs and sleeping with each other. Absolutely zero self-control. Just partying all the time. So in the Bouvier sisters episode, I had actually said that as long as Joe didn't bring his mistresses around the family or flaunt them in Rose's face, that it was accepted in the Kennedy home. But in Robert Dalek's book, An Unfinished Life, it says that Joe did bring them around the house. Here's a quote from Betty Spaulding, the wife of one of Jack's closest friends who witnessed all of it. Quote, And the old man, having his mistresses there at the house for lunch and supper. I couldn't understand it. It was unheard of. And allegedly, he would tell visitors that these women he had hanging around his house were just friends of his daughters. Ooh, so they were much younger probably too. And just like, what a freaking creep. What a weirdo. But Rose did have a limit. Joe's affair with actress Gloria Swanson almost caused a divorce. In the late 1920s, one of Boston's newspapers reported that Joe's calls to Gloria in California from New York amounted to the, quote, largest private telephone bill in the nation in the year of 1929. Honey Fitz, remember he's Rose's dad, told Joe to end it or he would tell Rose. Joe tried to never make his affairs so obvious that Rose couldn't deny them to herself or to gossiping friends. But Joe was so stubborn that he told Honey Fitz that if he told Rose, he would divorce her and marry Gloria instead. This one sent splinters through the entire family. It really affected the kids. But wait until you hear this. Gloria sent a huge bouquet of flowers to Rose for Jean's birth. And this was not just to congratulate her for having a baby. This was a guilt present. Was it? I would take it as like a shoving it in your face present. It was full on open season at that point. In October 1928, Joe brought Gloria's kids to a Halloween event alongside his kids. And soon after testing those waters, trying that out, he ended up flying Gloria straight into Hyannisport, the family home, vacation home, and made Rose play nice with the woman she knew was sleeping with her husband. Oh, heck no. Biographies say that the consequences from that affair never went away. Gloria scarred the Kennedys. Mm. They were a beautiful match on paper, Joe and Rose. They were just such opposites when it came to the way that they saw the world and how they wanted to interact with it. Joe also thought that Rose belonged to the kitchen and he held her back from living the life that she wanted to live. She mostly played the quote-unquote good wife and repressed her desire to do more. She was not a perfect parent either. Here's a quote from Rose complaining to her children in February of 1942. 
quote, Your father, again, has restricted my activities and thinks the little woman should confine herself to the home. Rose Kennedy was also unhappy because she was a single mom most of the time with all of Joe's business trips to New York and L.A. Obviously, she had a nanny and like lots of staff at home, so she had all of the domestic help that she needed, but it was just incredibly lonely. And she was pregnant for nearly 40% of the first 18 years of their marriage. That is crazy to me. She was super social in her single life before she was married. She was the glamorous daughter of the mayor and a debutante. And now she's almost totally isolated, confined to her house, surrounded by children, while Joe is off gallivanting, having this freaking huge career, making tons of money, having a grand old time, and cheating on her all the while. So she left. Briefly. In early 1920, she was pregnant with Kathleen, her fourth baby, when she took her other three kids, Joe Jr., Jack, and Rosemary, and then Kathleen's in her stomach. She went and stayed at her parents' house for three weeks before Honey Fitz told her to, quote, Go back where you came from. (laughs) Thanks, Dad. She was exhausted, but she was also a devout Catholic who believed that divorce was a non-option, and so she went back to freaking Joe, determined to be a good wife and make it work. So they came up with an agreement, Joe and Rose, on how to make their marriage last and allow her to stay sane as a mother. She could regularly travel around the United States and pretty much wherever she wanted to, to give her some freedom from the constant household demands. In the mid-30s, she made 17 trips to Europe where she shopped for the latest fashions and lived it up as a tourist. They also made arrangements that Joe would be home anytime she was gone or at least close enough to tend to the children. Another rule they came up with was the promise to each other that neither of them would burden each other with home life or family problems while they were gone so as not to ruin their trips. I'm like beginning to wonder why they had children. (laughs) Honestly. So he would not contact her even if things went wrong with the kids and she would do the same for him. So when she got in a car accident and had a large gash in her forehead, she did not tell Joe until he came home from Hollywood. And when the Kennedy home was struck with a measles outbreak, Joe did not tell Rose until she was back from her six-week trip to California. Quote, He did not want to worry me and perhaps cause me to cancel part of my trip, Rose recalled. And when she got in that car wreck, Joe called from California. She was literally lying down with a, quote, good-sized gash in my forehead. I spoke naturally, gave him news of the children, told him what a fine day it was, a perfect day for golf. Then I drove to the hospital where the doctor took five stitches in my forehead. (laughs) So she literally, like, actively was like... Don't say anything. Play it cool. It was an accommodation that allowed them to keep their family in one place. So I guess there's that. But which is worse on the kids? I have no clue. A decade later, in 1939, Reader's Digest put out an interview with Rose asking her how she ran her family. Quote, Years ago, we decided that our kids were going to be our best friends and that we could never see too much of them. She explained that with Joe being gone so often, it wasn't practical to have adult friends and go to dinner parties because they didn't want to share their precious time when he was home with random people who were not family. So they poured every ounce that they had into being Kennedys. They were at the helm during the most turbulent moment in American history. The rumors are legion, some sincere, some slander. They gave everything to their country. But what did it look like behind closed doors, in their homes, the most intimate moments of their time on earth? Sometimes the truth is more wild than the headlines. They seemed to live the easy life, but they lost it all in an instant. They ran faster, worked harder, burned brighter 
And then, they were gone. You have just listened to The Kennedy Siblings, Episode 1, from Blood and Business. Thank you all for listening to today's episode. If you enjoyed it, please give us a review on Apple, rate us on Spotify, and share Blood and Business with a friend or a sibling. If you'd like to support the show, the best way is to become a patron of Blood and Business. You will get bonus content every month, including a monthly bonus episode, interactive main episodes, and behind the scenes footage. To keep up with us day to day, you can follow us at Blood and Business on Instagram and TikTok. You can find the link for Instagram, TikTok, and Patreon in the show notes below. Thank you so much for the support, and we will see you back here next week for your regularly scheduled programming on Blood and Business. The main source for this episode was An Unfinished Life, John Fitzgerald Kennedy by Robert Dalek. To see a complete list of sources for all Blood and Business episodes, head on over to Patreon for a free PDF download.